This is Charlie Rose. Shai Agassi is here. He is the founder and CEO of Better Place. The December issue of Foreign Policy Magazine calls him an electric car prophet. His three-year-old startup company is a global leader in the electric vehicle services industry. It has attracted more than $700 million in venture capital. Israel, Denmark, Australia, and the United States have announced plans to build its infrastructures, including networks of charging spots and battery switch stations. As the world grapples with climate change, Gassi sees electric vehicles as the answer to the central question, how do you run an entire country without oil with no new science? I am pleased to have him here to answer that question and more at this table for the first time. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Tell me your story. Uh, American born? Uh, Israeli born. Israeli born. Yeah. yeah. And, and the American connection is? Well, I moved my uh, company back in uh, 95. I had a software startup in Israel, and I moved it to uh, California to work with a, a fruit company called Apple. And, uh, <laughs> How are they doing? Uh, they're doing fantastic. Are they doing well? And, yeah. uh, but they kicked me out in uh, 96. I worked on, uh, on a product that um, somebody at Apple at the time, before Steve came back, yeah. said that uh, I was working on a technology that would never uh, pick up. It was called uh, Internet Browsers. And, oh, no, they didn't. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you so, believed in Internet Browsers. Uh, we believed in Internet Browsers. Yeah. And so I, I, we were sort of thrown out, um, but it's, it's the classic American dream. We were uh, two weeks away from bankruptcy, raised some capital, venture capital in California, and yeah. a year and a half later sold that company for $110 million. Yeah. And then did what? Um, I was asked to stay in that company and sort of got acquired into uh, one of the largest software companies in the world called SAP. And, uh, and I grew within SAP to become the president of all products. I was, uh, I was supposed to be the next CEO. Right. Um, and, uh, and I joined the forum of uh, young global leaders in uh, Davos in, right. uh, as part of the World Economic Forum. And in 2005, they asked us a uh, question, um, how would you make the world a better place by 2020? And uh, I think it sort of creates a, an early onset of the midlife crisis when they, they tell you what, whatever you do doesn't make the world a better place. Right. Uh, and I came up with that question. What if we could run a country uh, without oil um, and have that happen within the next 15 years in a way that every country in the world can replicate it? Uh, I didn't have the answer, but I had the question. And, uh, and at night on the flights to Germany and back, I was reading all the books and I was trying to uh, put a solution. SAP headquarters being in Germany. Yeah, right. and uh, and I was trying to put a solution together on paper, and I wrote one one white paper after the other, and I just couldn't get it uh, done on e everything that everybody was was uh, telling me that it you know would be ethanol or hydrogen or something else. And then we I came back to electric cars, and I I was able to put a system together on paper, and uh, and oil was starting to come up and just getting to about $35, $40 a barrel. And, uh, and I felt like I had a solution. I had a way to um, get it done. Um, and Electric cars can eliminate our dependence on fossil fuels. On oil. On oil. And I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a critical distinction because everybody's talking about our energy dependence. Right. We don't have an energy dependence in the U.S. We have an oil dependence in right. the U.S., but we have every other form of energy, both... We have coal, we have natural gas. And renewables. And we have renewables. we have endless wind and solar. We, right, right. we can we have we have all the energy we want to make electrons. We have no energy to make our cars go. So we're addicted to driving cars, but we have no oil to fuel them. There was a time in our history in which uh, there was a choice between going electric or going internal combustion. Yeah, about a hundred years ago. Yeah. Uh, here, here, actually, in New York, if you went back a hundred years in time, there were more electric cars in the streets than gasoline cars. And what happened? Um, Henry Ford came up with the uh, uh, with the uh, starter, with the electric starter, and um, Ford Model T took off. Um, I think actually two things happened at the same time. Uh, the electric light bulb uh, that Edison brought in uh, took off, and it replaced the use for oil, which was kerosene at the right, time. So right. oil became really cheap to the right. point where it was it was basically nobody wanted it, so it right. was at zero. Right. Um, and electricity started to, the demand started to ramp up, and so there was no electric uh, power available at the stations. And so people were looking for what to do with, uh, with oil, and there was no electricity, and they decided to port it over to cars, and that, was, that became the market. Back to your question, though. And so if, in fact, we can develop electric cars mm -hmm. and electric vehicles, right. 
we can then eliminate our dependence on oil. Absolutely. We, we import a billion dollars of uh, oil for cars every day into the United States. Um, that's probably the biggest um, issue that, that is, is the stumbling block in our um, trade balance, in our deficit, in, um, in the way we will conduct business and the economy in America. And most people do not connect it as such a big, uh, big item, but um, I'll illustrate it for a second. In 2000, um, a gallon was a buck. Right. By 2008, a gallon was already at four and a half dollars. The cost to an American household, to the, the sort of the middle class, of that effectively a Chinese tax on, on the U.S. economy because Chinese added cars and, and the cars required oil uh, was about $3,200 per year. The, the tax cut that we got back, the refund, was $300. So the government gave you $300, but the oil took you 3000 And that took away the ability for most people to pay their mortgages, mortgage market crashes, the economy goes down. What percentage of oil goes to transportation? Fifty percent. Fifty percent. Yeah. Okay. What's the barrier for electric cars to crash in order to eliminate the internal combustion engine? Well, the fundamental point, which most people didn't understand, is that you need to make an electric car that will be more convenient and more affordable than a gasoline car. Until you make an electric car more convenient and more affordable, consumers will not buy it. You'll get a small percentage of believers that will buy 1,000, 10,000 of those cars, but you're not going to get to mass market. You're not going to get to 50% plus of the market. Once you get to that point, a consumer will pick the cheapest car they can get and the most convenient car they can get, and then they're willing to pay just as much as gasoline to drive it a mile. Mm. The entire market went the other direction. The, the car makers basically said, pay us more. So pay us you know, between $10,000 and $20,000 more to buy a car, an electric car. Lose something on convenience. It can't go too far. It's small. It's not as fast. And um, all the myths that we remember about electric cars. But then you can save on the, on the mile. You can pay less on the mile. And it was the exact opposite of what consumers wanted. In a better place, we're the first company actually made electric cars cheaper and more convenient than gasoline cars. How did you do that? Well, we, we came to the realization that the battery, which most car makers looked at as a component of the car, is, is really the, the consumable. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's the replacement for oil. It just doesn't burn. Right, right, it, right. it sort of slowly decays over 8, 10 years. It decays to a point where we call it a dead battery. But so it, the key to this game is think of oil as, the new, as battery as the new oil. That's right. And think of the service provider, better place, the operator as we right. call it, um, as the new gas station network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and instead of asking the consumer to buy the battery on year one or day one and pay all that money and then be stuck with the, the, the sort of limitation of the battery, we buy the battery. We own the battery just like an oil company drills for oil. We, right. we, we don't have a rig blowing up in the middle so of, a better uh, place of the Gulf. So better places in what kind of business? We're an operator, much like a, a, um, a cell phone company, uh, AT&T, um, is an operator for, uh, for cell phones. Uh, and much like a gas station network, like a, a, a Chevron is an right, operator right. for cars, we're an operator for electric cars. We buy the batteries, we sell the miles. So lay out your vision and your... We, we, be a profit for us. <laughs> so basically what we've seen is that the, the cost of driving an electric car is a combination of the cost of the battery and the cost of electricity. But the battery is, is a consumer electronics device, which we all know, just like any other device uh, we, we use, gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every year. And so our cost of the gallon equivalent, so our cost of driving a mile, gets cheaper almost by half every two years. That creates a, bus a fantastic business model because oil keeps going up and our cost keeps going down, and we sell just like gasoline. We sell miles. And are we at the infancy of battery technology? We're, we're, we're in the middle of its life. It's, uh, for the last 35 years, batteries got um, twice better every five to seven years. Uh, and most likely will continue to improve. In, in longevity, in power, in what? In a mix of the cost per unit of energy and the number of cycles on that battery. We all remember that, um, go back 10 years, your cell phone after about a year right. 
would lose most of its power and you buy a new battery. Right. Today, nobody even notices that. So today, when you think of it, um, bat batteries, batteries sort of better. outlast right. the right. device. The reason is, 10 years ago, we had 200 cycles, charge, discharge cycles. Right. Today, we have 2,000. Um, 200 cycles, about half a year to a year. 2,000 cycles, you don't notice. And what's the velocity of change in batteries? It's every two years, every three it's years? About every, some every two years, our something. cost per mile goes down by half. Now, what it means is that we get a delta that gets gets to be better and better and better every every two years. What we've done, which is where where the the business model is different, we basically figured out what the cell phone guys have been doing forever. We take part of that margin, part of the minute, part of the mile, and we apply it back to the cost of the car, making the car cheaper to buy. And so over time, those cars will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, cheaper to buy. Your philosophy is that this will only fly if you address the reason that people will buy cars. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to buy cars because you tell them they're environmentally better. Absolutely. They will only buy cars because you tell them that they are more efficient, they're less expensive, and they'll do a better job. The most successful introduction of environmental technology to the car, the Prius. Right. We've, we've gone, I think, 15 years now since the Prius has been introduced. It was only $3,500 more expensive than the equivalent car. It was just slightly less fast and, and less convenient, if you want, than the normal car. But because of those tiny differences, $3,500 and, and, uh, and a bit less speed, less than 2% of people bought the Prius. Now flip the equation for a second. What if the electric car was $5,000 cheaper than a gasoline car and was faster and more convenient than the gasoline car. You should see the exact opposite. 98% of people will actually go to the electric cars, not because they're environmentalists, but because they want to save money. And is anything more satisfying about the electric car beyond cost it's in, in comparison to an internal combustion engine? Well, first of all, an electric car is very fast. I mean, most people don't realize that, but it's uh, the first car we're putting on our network um, is twice faster on its acceleration than its um, combustion engine equivalent. It, on acceleration. Which is what we notice. It's uh, not necessarily top speed, it's acceleration. Big boys notice the moment that you press the pedal and the car speeds off and yeah, the, and I, the I guy next to you would, would have been left in the, exactly. uh, in no, the that, smoke, but there's no feeling. smoke. That's right. That's a great feeling. I, so so we, we measure the speed from 30 to 50 and 50 to 70. Yeah. If, if you think about it, it's the it's passing speeds. It's the when you right. really need speed to, to move away from the next car. And we're twice faster and so on... And you touch the accelerator and it just boom. And boom. There's no having to catch the, up. There's, there are no gears. It's one of the things that most people don't realize. You press the pedal and you're immediately at the maximum power that the uh, motor can give you. Same thing you notice is there's no noise. So you can actually sit in the car and enjoy power and silence, which is what we, in our minds, match to uh, the luxury cars, the Lexuses and the Infinities, is power with no noise. The question you'll probably ask more often than anything is, so what about this thing they call anxiety? The worry that I'm going to be somewhere. I'm going to get stuck. I'm going to be stuck. So that was the, the, the heart of the Better Place solution. We realized that if, if you need to drive a car on a freeway and suddenly you run out of battery and somebody asks you to stand on the side of the, the road for three hours to charge your battery, it's no longer a car. Right. It's, it's a sort of a it's bad a greyhound. It's, it's, a, a it's a bad greyhound bus right. that got stuck on the way. And so because we've separated between the ownership on the car and the battery, we created these uh, robots, it's effectively mm -hmm. like a, an automated gas station, where you drive your car and your depleted battery, the empty battery, goes out and a full battery comes in in less than a minute. And that depleted... That's, that's your filler-up thing. It's, it's an automatic replacement. Right. Now, we learn that from kids. You ask a five-year-old that has a radio-controlled car, would they like the rechargeable battery or the switchable battery, the, the one that you can buy Duracells at the store? And they'll tell you, I want both. I want the rechargeable battery so I don't need to ask mom to uh, buy me new batteries every time I finish playing with it. But I want the switchable battery because if the, the other kids from the neighborhood come over and my battery's not charged, I want to put a Duracell in and keep playing. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. We basically have a battery that's most of the time going to be recharged. When you come home, when you go to work, you come home, you go to work. But then it's switched when you're on the freeway and going from New York to D.C. Okay, so what, where is the finest example? Is, is Israel the place yeah. that I, somebody might go and say, this is the way it'll work? 
So we, we started in Israel. We, had, uh, we raised the capital to put a network across the country, 55 of these switch stations across the country, right. charging spots in parking lots across the country. And um, we, we're putting the network in the ground right now. You, you'll be able, in, in about two months' time, to drive from any spot in Israel to any spot in Israel, switch your battery, keep on going, and drive across an entire country without waiting for your battery to be charged, without any inconvenience. Yeah. This is primarily, though, meets the need of those people who travel more than, say, 40 miles yeah. a day. Because, like, what do they say? 50% of the people, or even larger percentage, go less than 40 miles a day. It, the, two issues. One, um, if you come to a person and say, all you need is 40 miles, mm -hmm. um, they'll tell you, but every once in a while I need to go beyond 40 miles right. and I don't want to be stuck. So right. the reality is what you need is about three times your daily drive. You... you and we found out with consumers that what you want is the ability to go from home to, home to work. Mm. And even if you forgot to connect your cable because you came with your gym bag and you were running into a meeting and you come back to your car, you want to be able to drive back home, not get stuck. Right. And then even if you forgot to charge at home, you want to be able to go back to work the next morning. So three times the distance is sort of the minimum that drivers want. And that ends up being about 100 miles. What's wrong with hybrid cars? You know, like the Volt is a hybrid. There's nothing wrong about it, but uh, again, looking at the at, at a lot of these cars we're coming into the market right now at about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars, that takes away a lot of the consumers from uh, even considering right, right. that car. And and what you need to be is in the range of about fifteen thousand dollars, not in the range of forty thousand dollars. Because if you look at the average car in America, and it's not the twenty thousand dollar SUV that you see in in commercials, the average car in America is an eight year old car. The average American driver drives an eight-year-old car. That car doesn't cost $20,000. It costs $5,000. You tell that average driver, you're going to buy a $40,000 green car, it not even in consideration. Mm -hmm. we got to get down to about fifteen, and then down to $10,000 if we really want to switch the country away from oil. And how long will it take else. to get there? I'll, I'll, I'll make a bold prediction. Um, Israel, which will have the network open on January 1st, 2012, at the latest, where we're planning to open tests. Wait, how many stations? 55 stations. Okay. Um, we're planning to open a network for tests in June of this year, but uh, full opening be beginning of 12. By 2015, more than 50% of new cars in Israel will be uh, electric. By 2017, probably 90% of new cars. What will a charging station look like? It's, uh, think of, uh, of a smart socket in your garage. Um, a socket that if a kid, if it's in the middle of the street and it's raining and a kid puts a wire into it and nothing happens. Yeah. And a separate meter so that um, you can actually know how much uh, of your uh, electric bill actually yeah. gets to be paid by us and not by you. And a socket that allows the utility to actually decide which cars are charging based on how much electricity they got at any moment. Yeah, are we going to find ourselves in a situation in terms of people and consumers around the world in which there are all kinds of competing systems and unless you find some kind of standardization. So standards are happening on, on two fronts. One, there's, there's a standards body, um, you know, number of working committees right. that are trying to agree on, for, for the first thing, on the socket, mm -hmm. so that we don't need to figure out how to take an, uh, a car right, across right, borders right, and right, right, you know, right, go right. from one state to the other and it looks different. Find an adapter. Right. But at the same time, what, you're, what we, are, we need to realize is that some standards are happening um, by, by the force of the markets. So China, as an example, has decided to go electric. I mean, the Ministry of Science and Technology went in, did their research, decided to go electric, and then uh, they put in the top 16 companies in China into a room and said, we tell you to do this. So China goes by edict. <laughs> China you, about, you, you call that state capitalism. Uh, it, it's, it, it's an edict. It's a, they, they abolish things. And so if you look five, five, six years ago, China abolished the mini scooters that were going in the cities. You were not allowed to drive a scooter and was from one night to the next morning. And why did they do that? Because th they were, I mean, you couldn't breathe. Right. So you, you had these uh, uh, two piston scooters, one piston scooters right. that were just basically fuming all over the place. And, right. and they one, one day they abolished it. Today, China makes more electric scooters than the entire world put together. And it basically, overnight, they moved to electric scooters. China's going to do the same thing on cars. And so what does this mean for China? That it becomes the center of technology for uh, switching to all kinds of environmentally efficient lifestyles? So I think what you'll see in China, you go back to China 10 years from now, 
they'll probably make and sell about 40 million electric cars a year. Um, they'll make the batteries locally. They'll even make the electricity locally and not from coal, which is what most, most people are claiming today. You'll, you'll see a solar ring around the city that will generate electricity for the cars that drive in the city. Mm -hmm. Did you say in the answer to the question China or India, uh, China for the next 25 years and after that India? Yeah, I think that... Did the, you say something like that? I think demographics, um, at the end of the day, are the strongest force in, in economics. If you look at what, what happened to China is China's reduced the... Uh, because of the, the limitations on a number of kids you can have, mm -hmm. you're going to have, a, uh, 20 years from now, um, two kids that are supporting f uh, four, uh, four parents, a right, right, uh, right. number of grandparents, and uh, at that point they'll open up the number of kids that you can have. Right. So you'll come back to having two kids. I, I think they're already beginning to do that. You can't have two workers supporting 10 people. Right. Um, India is the flip case. India is, uh, has now got 50% of its population under 25. And so these kids are going to go into the, the, the labor force. India is bound to do the same thing, the reduction in the size of the family, because they won't be able to sustain. And so right. they'll have 50% of their workforce in their 30s and 40s with not a lot of kids and not a lot of parents to support. So India is getting into the same Chinese wave. India has not turned the, uh, the infrastructure investment on, and they're, they're already at 9% growth. So imagine India now overlay the last 10 years of China on top of India. And you can see where that goes. Yeah, the better place will be your company. And that's what you're trying to do. This is an entrepreneurial thing for you. Is it more than that for you? Is it yeah. more than simply, you know, you you started off with as a software guy, and then you sold that, and then then you you know you became a corporate executive, and then you decided, you know, that that you wanted to do something else, and so there you're in just one more entrepreneurial thing, or is this some other motivation for you? So I, I got to admit, I didn't, I didn't plan to be in, uh, in the electric car business. Right. I wrote the paper more, more of a, a thought piece. Right. I presented it in a conference, and then Shimon Peres, president of Israel. Right. Right. This is uh, a great story. Basically challenged me to, to make this into reality and you know, ran me around the country, met, met every minister, and ended up with a prime minister. And when the prime minister said, go find $200 million and find a car company that would make this car. And... When, uh, when I came back to uh, President Paris, he said, great, so go start a company. And I said, no, this is, this is a government office. It's, a, it's like NASA. Go, right. you know, right. The Israeli government should do this. I got a job. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he asked me this question. He said, this job must be so important because you can save your country and you can save the world. Instead of that, you choose to go back and being the CEO of SAP. Right. So can you tell me what that job does to the world? Because it must be really important. It was sort of a blue pill, red pill moment, right? So, yeah. so they, they, they hand you this. You can go back to your uh, comfort life and career, or you can go do something meaningful. And three days later, I quit my job. And, uh, and so nobody can blame me. I started this for, for money because nobody's ever made money from starting a, a government branch. It's, it's mm -hmm. never succeeded as a business plan. So what happened then? We approached um, five uh, large car makers, uh, in Davos of, uh, of 07, uh, only one of them had the, uh, the vision and, uh, and the, the imagination, the Nissan. profits. And that was Carlos Ghosn of, right. of Renault Nissan. This guy is, this guy is a genius, and um, he really came in, in in the meeting. And we had another executive who told us to not do this, but he came into the meeting and after about five minutes told uh, President Paris, I'm your partner. I'm going to make a wonderful car for you. I'm going to make the batteries for this. I'm, I'm in. Count me in. And, I'm, I'm going to, and he stood by his commitment uh, to the T, and it's just absolutely fantastic. Well, one car. thing you did is they've developed the Leaf, which is an all-battery car, an all-electric car. So it's not a hybrid. So they developed two cars. One right. is the Leaf from Nissan, and the other one is the Fluence from Renault. And, and, uh, and the Fluence is the one that we're going with in, in Israel, um, which we looked at, at an, uh, a much bigger sedan. We wanted to go after the suburban driver and not mm. the urbanite um, uh, driver, not the city driver. Mm. So we picked a bigger car. Uh, uh, more convenient, more comfortable, um, and and that's the car we're uh, first car we take in the market. But they he's he's really bet the company on uh, on the future being electric, and they've they're making nine different cars um, on that lineup. Okay, but now, but just take me back to what Better Place is today. So Better Place today is actually putting the network. Think of us right. as, as sort who, of Better Place is a quasi government company. No, or? no, 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 no. It's all public. We didn't all get public. a we never got a penny from the Israeli government. Right. Um, the Israeli government basically came in and put the legislation in place, the tax legislation, 
Um, okay, to, so this is a, this totally a private company. It's it's absolutely private company um, that has put the network now in Israel and in Denmark. We're about to start putting the network in Australia. And then when do you come to the United States? So we were, we're doing a trial in California um, where we have uh, a taxi network in the Bay Area of California. We just got awarded uh, money by the California government. So all the cars will be electric and they'll have a network that they can operate on in the Bay Area. Right. So it'll be 60 taxis that will drive up and down all the way from San Francisco to San Jose and can drive people into the airports and, and, and like taxis right, right. Um, across. And that, that will basically prove that it can work even in the uh, U.S. economic conditions. We've got a taxi network working in Tokyo where the Japanese government has actually uh, funded a project to prove that this works. And it's the first time we actually had an electric taxi go for, for more than 100 days nonstop because it basically switches and goes. Mm -hmm. And taxis are sort of the extreme driving. They, they never stop. They go 7 by 24. The first CEV taxis will be able to switch their batteries here. And by switching the batteries, they'll be able to extend the range. The battery switch process takes as little as 60 seconds, and that's much shorter than filling up a regular taxi. Here, uh, we are capable of handling as many as 12 batteries to ensure a constant supply of freshly charged batteries to the EVs. Most car makers said it was impossible. Today, not only is it possible, it's actually driving in the street, picking up passengers. Well, in Tokyo, taxis represent 2% of the total cars but they are responsible for 20% of the total emissions. So by eliminating the taxi emission, we'll be eliminating a large chunk of tailpipe emissions. What's going to happen in Brazil? Well, that's a good question. Brazil has moved um, historically towards ethanol. I mean, they, they're basically the, uh, the only country in the world that converts water into energy. Most other countries convert energy into water. Uh, and we're in discussions with the Brazilians. I just had, uh, I was on a panel last night with the uh, foreign minister from Brazil. This was in Washington? In, in D.C. Yeah. And, and if you really want to convert um, ethanol into, into driving, the most efficient way is to actually burn it in a power plant and send the electrons to the car. So they may actually take a step further, not only uh, generate uh, energy from cane, but also sugar cane, but also uh, get it electric to the cars. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having Pleasure. me. Swan Lake is one of the world's most popular and enduring ballets. It tells the story of a princess turned into a swan by an evil sorcerer's curse. It is also at the center of a new film by director Darren Aronofsky. The film stars Natalie Portman as Nina, a young ballerina tapped to play the coveted role of the Swan Queen. Here is a look at the film. I had the craziest dream last night about a girl who was turned into a swan. But her prince falls for the wrong girl, and she kills herself. He promised to feature me more this season. Well, he should. You've been there long enough. And you're the most dedicated dancer in the company. Our new swan queen, the exquisite Nina Sayers. I'm Lily. You're going to be amazing. I watch the way she moves. Sensual. She's not faking it. Seduces. Attack it. Attack it. Come on. Where'd you get these? I don't want to talk about that. You really need to relax. It's the role, isn't it? It's all this pressure. I knew it'd be too much. I knew it. Ow. What's she doing here? He made me your alternate. The only person. Nobody's after you. Please believe me. Sweet girl. Sweet girl. What happened to my sweet girl? She's gone! Joining me now, Darren Aronofsky, the film's director, and the star, Natalie Portman. I am very pleased to have both of them at this table. Well, Thank it's you. great to see you. Thank, Thank you very Congratulations. much. Thank you. Um, how long have you wanted to make this? Well, 
Natalie and I had a conversation about nine years ago in Times Square. We had a coffee <laughs> at the old Howard Johnson's, which yeah. I think is now an American apparel. <laughs> and uh, that was our first conversation about it. And um, Natalie told me that all she, one of the things she always wanted to do was play a dancer. And over the years, I continued to develop it. It just was a very hard world to get into. The ballet world's very insular. and. You know, they wouldn't really let us in, and Natalie, we'd bump into each other, and she'd be like, how's that ballet movie coming? I'm getting too old to play. I'm like, you look great. It's fine. It's coming. And so it took a long she time. She does that with every director. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> she goes to every director. She's not, I always want to make a movie about. <laughs> and they're out working for her while she waits for them to get the project completed. I'm exactly. telling all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> So why did you want to do this? Why did this intrigue you? Well, I think first of all, working with Darren was um, a, a big, um, you know, because you a, fell in love with the wrestler or what? <laughs> well, when we talked about it, he hadn't made the wrestler yet, but um, he had made Pie and Requiem for right, a Dream, right. which already, um, you know, showed a, a great, great artist. Um, and and then I, I did always want to do a, a dance film. I, I danced. Um, when I was younger and always just loved going to watch dance, just such a cinematic kind of um, expression because it's movement rather than words. Yeah. The screenplay was this was set for Broadway originally? Yeah, there was an original early screenplay that was set in the off-Broadway world. And I had, my sister was a ballet dancer and I wanted to do something in the ballet world and I started to translate it, but it was it's a hard translation. It was called The Understudy, that, right, that script. Right, and right. And there's no understudies in ballet, so that was the first problem. So we really, the conversion really took a long time to figure out how to make it work. Now you went to Julia Kent to sort of understand. Well, I, I talked to a lot of dancers, Julie Murphy, Julie Kent, and Julie actually pointed out something great to me. I, she actually, very early on, she went through all the different Swan Lake dances with me, and I would ask her what exactly she was doing and performing. And then at some point, I was like, well, what what exactly is um, what exactly is this creature and she's like well during the day she's a swan and at night she's half swan half human and the idea of a were swan werewolf movie yeah, went over right, my head right. and so and then the possibility of turning that beautiful creature into, into uh, something, something darker <laughs> exactly <laughs> was very exciting so that was the thing that I kept coming back to um, did that appeal to you <laughs> As, well I think the obviously for an actor to get to play really opposing natures yeah, is, is always um, yeah, attractive yeah. And so tell me about the character, Nina. Well, Nina, um, I really f felt started um, as a child in this world, and her journey is sort of becoming a woman. Um, and it's really a world that, that keeps women as little girls. You know, they, they want them to um, starve themselves to not have breasts and mm. hips. They want them to, um, they call them girls, not women, not dancers, they refer to them as girls. Um, they're asking this core of dancers to conform to very specific standards where they're all lifting their legs at the same time. So there's a real sort of, um, you know, for a very female art, there's a real sort of male domination of it. So um, it really was, is, you know, finding pleasure for herself rather than pleasing other people that allows her transformation to a woman and allows her to sort of kill the little girl. Uh, the casting of Vincent Cassell. He was a really originally written Russian, and then I, I'm a huge fan of Vincent Cassell's. I mean, he's since Lahaine and Gaspar Noe's work. He's just an amazing actor. There's no one like him. Sexy, different looking, powerful. And uh, as soon as he got into my head, I just tracked him down, and I was like, "You got to do this." And you know, every other scene. Now, how do you sell an actor on? Him? Well, every other scene he has to make out with either Natalie Portman or Mila Kunis, <laughs> so it wasn't very hard. It's like, "Oh, what's today?" You know. So he's, it was a pretty good role for any actor, I think. Yeah. yeah. Describe the character he plays. He's the artistic director of this fictional New York City ballet company, and um, he's—it's an interesting character because he definitely uses se his sexuality to manipulate the dancers, but he's very clearly an artist. So, it, for him as an actor, was able to justify his behavior. Now, did you talk to people like Peter Martins about? We did. We, you know, I think Balanchine was was more of a kind of an influence. The concept yeah, of but him. It's hard to talk to Balanchine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, uh, Vincent met with um, Peter Martins and the head of ABT, as well as um, saw Baryshnikov teach right. a few classes. So he had a lot of these. Um, and then Benjamin Milpier, our choreographer, right. spent a lot of time with him. So that's how that's where he developed the. Camera. Other than New York, what's the ballet capital of the world today? I guess it's. Paris, Moscow, and London. Well, yeah, Those would be the three great ballets mm -hmm. right now. 
Mm-hmm. And St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg. Yeah, so. St. Petersburg is what I was saying. Yeah, the Kira, the Bolshoi, yeah. the Royal, and the and Paris, Paris Opera. Opera. Right. Roll tape. Tell us about that scene. Um, well, part of, of establishing this character as a little girl was doing this voice yeah. that Darren, when we first talked about it, was a little reluctant because he thought it might be silly. So we just were like, okay, you know, we'll try it. If it's not working, you just tell me and we'll... we'll... But where it came from was all the training that Nally did. She came to me at one point and said, have you noticed that all these dancers talk with these little baby voices? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah. oh, wow. And I, I, it goes back to what Natalie was saying before about the keeping girls. these, yes, and the, and the value of keeping them young. And yes. so we were interested, we were just nervous about it, because it's a big choice as, a, as an actor, but it was something to play with as she turns into the black swan. Yeah, absolutely. And and preparation for you. I mean, there are a whole bunch of ballerinas that have written books and everything else. Yeah, I, I Suzanne had Farrell the, and others. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I read the Suzanne Farrell. I read the Allegra Kent, the Tony Bentley. Right. I tried to locate it in the city ballet world because I think it's really helpful to have a, a very specific culture you're relating right, right. to, even though ours is not about city ballet and certainly not about the current city ballet. It was very much the sort of Balanchine world where Mr. B was deified and, and this whole sort of religion grew around him. Yeah. All right, roll tape. Here's another scene. This is where your rehearsal is interrupted by the arrival of the competition. So while we're watching this clip, guess what he says? <laughs> Boys and girls. <laughs> he said, when are we going to get to the dark stuff? And the reason he said that, he doesn't want you to think this is a film just about a ballet. He wants you to know that there's intrigue here. Uh, there's danger here. There's conflict here. What else? Horror. Horror here. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of scares in it too. It's, it's, it's. It, there's. We went back to Swan Lake, the ballet, and tried to take the actual ballet and translate it into a movie. Mm. So, and ba- uh, Swan Lake is really, you know, a, a fairy tale, and mm. so, and there's often very gothic and horrific elements in it, and melodrama, and then. We try to build everything out of that, including the music and everything. We sort of took Tchaikovsky's score and his story and sort of put it through the filter of a movie and made Black Swan. Can I tell the story about Shakespeare that we were talking about earlier? So we're having a conversation before this started with her, and, and I was talking about The Merchant of Venice, which just opened and gotten very huge reviews for The Merchant of Venice. And then I asked her when she might be playing Shakespearean characters, and she said, uh, Hamlet. <laughs> she did not mean Ophelia. <laughs> and, and so my question is, what did that say about you? <laughs> um, I like hard things. I like difficult things. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I would be a good soldier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, I don't think it's necessarily a positive thing because I think it's probably well, I do. better. I, because you be... think beyond the boundaries is what it says to me. Yeah. Well, you know, Sarah there's... Bernhardt did it, right? Indeed. Yes. So. There's a new book about her too. Yeah. Uh, has this world that you've chosen has it given you pretty much what you expected and what you wanted? You this mean career, acting yeah, career. This profession. This job. This. You know, I started when I was 11. I did my first film when I, I was 11, and. It's, so it's 18 years now that I've been working, which... Everybody doing quick math now, as you know. I'm 29. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think it's hard to say what you expected and wanted when choosing a career mm. when you're 11. I was like, I want to be famous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wasn't yeah. like thinking... But then you also decided you want to go to school. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Which um, definitely, um, I think, added to my ability to take the most out of How did you do that? Work. Um, it gave me the, I think, the um, ability to follow up on my curiosity, to really go after as deeply as I could anything that I was interested in. Um, it gave me the courage to voice my opinion, even to people I was intimidated by and really respected. You know, when you sit in a room with a professor who is so light years ahead of you intelligence wise and they listen to you with respect it gives you a different way of being able to to think and talk um and most importantly it gave me friends that are completely interesting completely inspiring and there for me whether i fail or or not which i think is is a, 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 a great security to have you wanted to make a dance movie because well, because you've I, been a dancer. I love dancing, that. but I, I really just it's it's such a beautiful way to express without words because words are so approximate um, and 
there's so much else to convey that that you can't. I mean, that's what cinema is about: is about conveying through image, movement, sound, um, and not you know the intangible, expressing the intangible. And 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 I think movement dance is is absolutely that. Which raises the obvious question: What are the similarities between making the wrestler and making <laughs> this? Well, there are a lot of similarities. I think when the writer, when we really started to dive in, the writer turned to me and first said, you know, there's a lot of connections between the two films, but I always like the idea that one is about the highest art and one is about the lowest art. Mm -hmm. If you want to call wrestling an art, some people <laughs> won't. Um, yet the leads um, in the film were artists that used their bodies, put their bodies first to create entertainment, to create, you know, to, to blow people away with what they can do. And, um, and then structurally, they're very, very similar. Um, but I thought and were willing to put their bodies at risk for the joy they found out of the performance. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you know they end in similar ways, and there's very similar structure. And but I think that's interesting because you know that's kind of the magic of cinema that you know being able to connect with a 50-something-year-old aging wrestler and a 20-something-year-old ambitious dancer. If the human emotions are real, you hopefully anyone can take a ride with them. How do you see the competition between the characters here? Um, well, it was really interesting. The first conversation Darren and I said, had in, in 2000, um, he said to me, it's going to be um, about the ego and, and sort of how, you know, you start, uh, you know, feeling the threat of the least different, you know, the, that threat of the least different person, the person who could most replace you um, when your ego sort of gets out of control because I remember you mentioned the double um, yeah. which is a... Dostoevsky's The Double was a big early influence. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and and that was um, uh, just really appealing to me because, again, that's really the world of women, I mean, where you're so easily replaceable, you hit a certain age and there's someone waiting to take your spot who's younger, younger than you. Yeah. Younger, thinner, prettier, and, you know, more appealing. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great way to sort of show how, you know, this woman can break out of that just by leaving this structure. Uh, you also casted Winona Ryder and, and Barbara Hershey. Tell me about casting. Winona was a really, it's a very interesting role because she plays this um, dancer who's being pushed out at the, you know, glorious age of 35. Because she's just, <laughs> Because the yeah. new young one's coming in. Right. Right. You know, and I thought the meta casting idea of a, um, which is sort of happening because Winona 10 years ago probably would be doing this type of role. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also it helped me because I, I needed to communicate to the audience that it was a star. And so when you see Winona's face, you go, she's kind of iconic in many right. ways. Um, and so she was willing to do it, take a small role, and it was really flattering to be on the front end of Winona Ryder's second chapter of her career, because I think mm -hmm. it's going to start for her again. You do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was incredibly pleasant and supportive and good. Mm -hmm. She just acted her butt off of me, so. Roll tape balance here. What's the sort of tension? Well, the tension is for the audience not to be f completely safe with what's happening to Nina. She's, you know, an unreliable narrator, and you're with her. It's a very subjective film, and the whole purpose is to get the, the, the whole purpose of my filmmaking was to get the audience into her experience. And she slowly loses her mind as the black swan and the white swan is fighting for control of her. And so as much as we could connect w with Natalie Portman's character, Nina, the more the audience will feel. So, yeah, it's a fine line to of when she goes crazy, how much can you allow the audience to think she's crazy or maybe she's not crazy? So that was that was the sort of tightrope walk of, of it. I ask this often of actors, what do you want from a director? I really, I love feedback. I mean, I think part of my, like, you know, I like, I just, I think artistic honesty is the, the key and I mean Darren is exactly that you know he'll tell you when it's not going well and he'll tell you when it's going well and you can trust that it's going well when he says it is because he'll tell you if it's not and he always had um, you know a million different ideas for every scene was always on top of it and then at the end would always say do this one for for yourself the last one do it for yourself which was just exactly the key to the character because it was what Vincent says to, you know, Vincent's character says to my character, which is find your own pleasure, which is 
at the root of being an artist, which um, Darren handed to Find me. Find your own pleasure. Find your own pleasure. Because you're trying to, so often as an actor, you're pleasing your director. It's like, you know, the kids at the pageants at yeah. the end when they like right. look at their mom right after they right. finish doing right. their right. song. Sometimes you're like that as an actor. You finish the scene, you're like, how was it? You know? Right, 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 right. And, um, and when, when they're saying, just do it for yourself, it's a whole new world opens and and Darren gave that to me because directors often say like do a freebie or a free one but just putting those words articulating it in that particular way d do it for so yourself. So if you do it for yourself are you demanding much of yourself? Oh. <laughs> Can is she, is she? Well, I think what, what it did is it just... One she, of those people who says, you say, I've got it, and she says, another take. Yeah, no, it, it was basically, I think she trusted me that I had yes. it, and that, we need, that I, I was happy, and I could make the scene work. So I just freed her, and yeah. I just said, you know, whatever comes out. And, and you know, probably 70% of the time we ended up using that take, and <laughs> yeah. but the other 30% it didn't work, yeah. and it was yeah. fine. We had it from something else, and we were safe, so we just had fun with it. You said at some point you wanted to put girl roles behind you, and mm -hmm. I mean, where is this? Well, that was actually, I think, when people ask, everyone, I think because they think I'm sort of a good girl, they think the black swan is like the big, mm. um, you know, transition. Tra <laughs> <Not> transform it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, secrets. Um, but the really hard part was going back because I so wanted to leave that little girl voice behind. You know, um, Nichols for years was trying to get me. Mike Nichols was After trying you to. Did the, what was close, um, we did the seagull up, right. together yeah, right, on yeah. stage, and from then on, he was getting me to voice coaches all the time. He said, You to have to get, get rid of. Get rid of your little girl voice. He's like, you talk like a child. Get rid of it. And he had me like, was constantly giving me that feedback. Like, you need to fix your voice. <laughs> and um, and so it was hard for me to go back because it felt like a regression. But it was also I got to put my whole twenties into it. You know, that whole experience mm -hmm. of getting out of that voice into the part. Um, and and it was really really helpful. What's your ambition now? I think to to get back to enjoying not working. <laughs> I, um, I, I've been working so much and I think I've gotten into a sort of, um, yeah, workaholism that is unhealthy. So um, I'm learning to um, enjoy my life without having to be busy all the time. So how did you get there? Why did you get there? Probably because I, um, you know, for the first time, all my friends had jobs. <laughs> all of my friends were have real work, mm -hmm. and no one was free during the day to hang out or do anything. And um, and I didn't have, you know, a real personal life. And I just threw you myself into. Did not into, have a real personal life. Yeah, and so I just sort of put everything into my work. And um, now I feel that it's time to you know, find find my So personal. suppose someone said to you today, I mm -hmm. just everything is fabulous. You know, the movie's great. <laughs> We've launched it, even though the premiere's oh, in a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, the premiere's over, just go, do. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What kind of thing would you know I wanna go would home. <laughs> I want to be home. Oh. I like want to be home more than anything. Really, you know, it's in your weird. house in Los Angeles? Or we're, yeah, or or in New York near right. my family and my friends. Yeah. On Long Island? Yeah, my parents yeah. are on Long Island. Yeah, I mean, it's just um, our work takes us away. Our work takes us away from our life. It's a very yeah. unusual thing. It, regardless of how much how much exposure we have to the world, there's always a part of you that just wants to be home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. we are so lucky with work that we get to travel, we get to meet yeah. such interesting people. We're doing super exciting things all the time. Mm -hmm. So that when, like, actually Mila and I were talking about how actresses don't really care about getting married. Right. Because we're like, we get to dress up and have our, like, premieres all the time. Yeah, <laughs> like, right, it's right, the yeah. worst. We just want to be in sweatpants and at home. <laughs> Congratulations on this. Black Swan, it opens December 3rd in theaters. Um, Thank you again. Great Thank to see you. you. So much. Great Thank to see you, you very you much. Too. Nice to meet you, John.